introducing Amy Payne, um, who will do our next session. Um, before we get started, I'd just like to um, reiterate the thanks for our sponsors, the um, uh, Lilibut um, University College in Denmark and also the Association of Radical Midwives who without their support this conference wouldn't be um, able to be able to proceed and particularly I'd like to thank everybody else who has been behind the scenes getting us to this point today. Um, the, uh, if you haven't set up your audio and you think you might want to ask a question, if you just go to meeting and then work your way through the audio wizard setup, it's quite easy to do. Um, a good idea to have your uh, a headset plugged in before you actually log into the meeting. Um, sometimes that makes a difference. There's a chat window which most people have found, and you're able to type in um, your questions and just press enter. Um, you can give us feedback at the top and most people have found that um, place where you can raise your hand or agree with the speaker um, and if you step away from the meeting you can signal that you have sp uh, stepped away. Um, if you wish to make a, uh, a comment or a question you can put it in the text box or you can raise your hand and uh, the host will enable you with a microphone so that you're able to ask your question. And I spoke with Amy and she's happy to take um, points of clarification um, during her presentation. Uh, any major questions probably are better uh, reserved for the end of the presentation, uh, which you have more time to respond to them. Um, when you, uh, if, you, if you are given a microphone, then you click on the microphone um, icon. Uh, it's next to your name in the attendees box. Uh, and to speak you just click on the mic symbol at the top uh, and it will change from white to, um, to green. And don't forget to turn it off um, when you have finished speaking, uh, otherwise we get interference. Um, if people can't hear you, um, click on the microphone symbol and adjust the microphone volume. Um, you've started the recording, thank you very much. Um, so, at this point I have great pleasure in introducing Amy Payne who is, hails from Texas uh, and we've had a few conversations and Amy's quite um, well travelled internationally and has worked in, in several areas, just having completed her um, uh, doctorate in nursing practice. So, um, her presentation is called Shared Decision Making for Vaginal Birth After Caesarean section. So welcome Amy and I'll hand it over to you. Thanks Dean. Hi everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Um, just a, a little bit background on myself. I'm Kate and there are several tracks for the Queen Midwife. And um, the track I chose was to do the doctoral program. Is this better? Yes, that's much better, Amy. Okay, sorry. Thank you. So, I was just saying that um, in the U.S. there are several tracks for becoming a midwife, and the track that I chose was um, to do the doctoral program in um, nursing practice, and so that was a four-year degree, and I just finished. Um, I'm taking my boards in about. 10 days, so then I'll be an official clinical midwife. But um, as part of my school requirements, I had to do a project, um, and I decided to do a shared decision making program for um, vaginal birth after cesarean section. So um, in, I'm not sure what everyone knows about the US, but you've probably heard that um, the C section rates are very high, and they've risen over the past couple of decades. Sorry to interrupt you, Amy, but uh, if you're on micro, do you, if you have a microphone that uh, is a smartphone microphone, please hold it up to your mouth. Uh, otherwise, you can adjust your volume by clicking on uh, the arrow just next to the microphone uh, icon. Okay, better. 
Okay. Yeah. I just changed the um, earphone, so maybe my other one wasn't working. Okay, sorry about that. So um, I am doing shared decision making for um, vaginal birth after C-section, and the cesarean section rates have risen a lot over the past couple of decades in the United States. Um, the current C-section rate in the United States is at a record high of 32.8%. And that's an increase of 53% from the years 1996 to 2000. Um, so that makes nearly one in three births in the United States um, being um, a C-section. And so it's the most commonly performed surgery here. Um, repeat C-sections account for um, about 534,000 of 1.5 million C-sections performed. Um, and as you know, they're not without consequences. Repeat C-sections can lead to increased health care costs, um, increased adverse outcomes for mother and baby, and complicated subsequent pregnancies. So in the U.S., they account for almost half of childbirth-related expenses, and they also result in a longer recovery period. Um, and also a systematic review showed that Early breastfeeding is delayed with elective C-section versus um, vaginal delivery. Um, so a vaginal birth after C-section is a safe option um, for some women after a prior, uh, prior C-section. Um, and in the U.S., um, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the American College of Nurse Midwives, and the National Institutes of Health all support a trial of labor after C-section. Um, so I don't know what the the VBAC and TOLAC rate is um, for every other country here. Um, so I'm just speaking from the United States. Um, so according to level A evidence um, set by ACOG, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, um, they say that women who have had one previous C-section with a low transverse uterine incision and have no other conditions um, that require C-section, such as a prior um, uterine surgery or placenta previa, are eligible for um, TOLAC. So about 60 to 80 percent of women who are candidates for the trial of labor after C-section and attempt a VBAC will be successful in having their VBAC. Um, so the national VBAC rate in the U.S. is very low. It's 8.5 percent. Linda, I see that you say it's up to 30 percent in the U.K. Um, it's kind of embarrassing that the U.S. is so far behind, but um, it is what it is. That's why I did this project. Um, and the reason that the VBAC rate is so low here is because of the resistance of key stakeholders. A lot of hospitals don't even offer TOLAC um, because they're, they're afraid. And then um, also the fear of adverse outcomes are instilled in women. So the maxim once a cesarean, always a cesarean, although not supported by scientific evidence, is still used here um, in the U.S. by physicians. Um, so routine obstetric care in regard to a delivery method after a C-section often involves a health care provider um, just telling a woman which avenue she will take simply um, by providing a pamphlet or just giving a leaflet. So in this practice model, women are not presented with the current evidence-based knowledge about the choices that she has um, and the risks and benefits of the decisions of her birth option after a prior um, C-section. So the lack of patient involvement in obstetric care may lead to poor outcomes and dissatisfaction with care due to dependence on medical technology and lack of met expectations and unnecessary interventions for both the mother and the baby. Therefore, um, women who meet criteria need help with decision-making process regarding their birth options. So one approach to assisting patients in making a healthcare decision is um, the shared decision-making model. And this is an approach where clinicians and patients share the best available evidence when faced with the task of making decisions and then the patients are supported um, to consider their options so that they can make an informed choice. So with shared decision-making, pregnant women actively participate with their healthcare providers 
um, and they can arrive at a decision about which option they want um, to do after a C-section. So um, as part of this shared decision-making um, model, um, a provider would give pamphlets, they would do videos, they would offer interactive online tools um, or paper tools, and then they would also do individual group counseling sessions. Um, Sorry, I didn't advance my slide. So um, anyway, um, I did a literature review of a few topics. Um, just wanted to see the risks and benefits of the VBAC. Um, I did the current guidelines. Um, I also looked at um, women's perceptions of VBAC and C-section. And then also looked at shared decision making in obstetrics. So the potential risks of VBAC are a fail TOLAC, um, which can be anywhere from 20 to 40 percent. A uterine rupture, and this is the thing that scares everybody here. This is why hospitals absolutely refuse to offer a VBAC or a TOLAC. Um, and it's actually low. It's 0 0.2 to 1.5 percent for low transverse incisions and 5 to 9 percent for vertical incisions. Um, and then another potential risk of a VBAC is fetal death, but that is an, also a very low risk. Um, another potential benefit, or some potential benefits of VBAC are shorter hospital stays. So um, here a woman would stay in the hospital for three to five days if she has um, um, a C-section. But um, if she has a vaginal birth, then she would only stay for um, 24 hours or, or 48 hours max. Um, another benefit of VBAC is an increased breastfeeding success. So we all know... Um, it's been well established that breastfeeding is best for the baby and um, anything to help a woman um, become successful in helping her baby breastfeed would be ideal. Um, another benefit of a VBAC is fewer maternal complications. So um, women are less likely to develop a fever or need a blood transfusion um, after a postpartum hemorrhage or they're, they're less likely to have blood clots or um, some kind of wound or uterine infection. Um, and then also another benefit is less neonatal respiratory distress. So shared decision making has already been used for a variety of women's health care decisions um, such as a cephalic version, so turning the baby if the baby's breech, it's been used for hormone replacement therapy. It's been used for epidurals. It's been used for um, helping someone decide about circumcision. So it's never, um, the, there hasn't been a systematic review or, or a study specifically on shared decision making for um, a VBAC. And so that's why I did this study. So the purpose of my project um, was to implement a shared decision making program. So in my program, I had an online um, or face-to-face -face education session about TOLAC. So in this session, I went over risks and benefits. Um, I followed the literature that said what makes shared decision-making more effective, and I offered handouts. I offered a video. Um, we interacted. We had an individual counseling session. And... Um, also, the Ottawa Institute has a great website, um, Good Job Canada. They have a whole list of um, interactive decision aid tools. So um, I, they're free for the public to use. Um, so I used the one regarding VBAC, and it was really good. Um, it just takes about five to ten minutes, and the woman goes through and um, Um, the, I want to evaluate the extent to which each phase of the shared decision-making program was effective um, to prepare the women to make a decision about trying for a VBAC. Um, I wanted to see if the women spoke to their health care provider because, you know, like I said earlier, a lot of times women um, had a, you know, primary C-section. Um, the online decision tool was called... Um, 
on pregnancy, what are my birth options? But I have the exact tool name here. Let me let me get it for you. I can send you a link um, later. It's on if you search the Ottawa Decision Aid Tools. Um, they have the resources posted there, and it says there's a little link on, when you get to the homepage. It says A to Z um, patient decision aid tools, and so there are several for pregnancy, and um, I believe there were two for VBAC, and I just liked the one um, regarding the the one that I chose about the birth option. So um, that's that's why I chose that one. Um, I also wanted to see if the women were able to make a decision and um, how women felt after making their decision, if they chose the feedback or repeat C-section and how they felt. Okay, so um, since I had some difficulty finding sites to um, help me with my recruitment, so I had to be very strict with my inclusion criteria. I only followed level A evidence for ACOG, um, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Um, many practices go ahead and follow the level B um, guidelines too, which say that you can include, you know, two, C -sec um, two previous C-sections in there, but um, I, with my settings that I had an agreement with, I could only do one. So um, my inclusion criteria were currently pregnant with um, head down, one pregnancy, um, one previous C-section, and could read. Yes, I will be explaining and describing the phases of the shared decision making. Um, yeah. Um, so the exclusion criteria were previous major uterine surgery and a classical vertical or T-shaped uterine incision with previous C-section. So I had three settings in North Texas. Um, they were a mixture. One was a very large group of um, 13 providers. And um, there were two midwives on that staff. And then the rest were 11 were physicians. Um, and then one was a, a group of three, two physicians and one part-time midwife. And then another one was a very large, well, large for, yeah, that's it, health-wise. Thank you um, for posting that. Um, so the other one was a very large midwife group in, in Texas, so there were eight midwives. Um, and for the recruitment, I put flyers in the exam and waiting rooms, um, and then also the either the uh, medical assistant or the midwife would give a flyer handout to the women who met um, the inclusion criteria. And then um, this handout, the women would read the handout, and if they're interested in participating, then they would um, contact me by phone or email um, and then say they want to participate. Um, so here, here you go, um, Sheila, the shared decision-making program. So it was two phases. Um, the first phase, I started off doing, offering a group education session, but um, everyone had difficulty meeting up at one time. Um, there were toddlers um, or school-age children. So um, I did one individual one-on-one, -on -one, and then um, I ended up later on when recruitment was very slow, I just went ahead and developed an online version. So um, if any of you use iMovie on the Mac, um, that's what I did. It was a 20-minute video. Um, it was exactly the same as the face-to-face -face session, um, and um, I went over risks and benefits, and um, also included a video in there of a woman talking about her successful VBAC experience. Um, and then we had a conversation afterwards on the phone, um, if we couldn't meet in person, about um, how they felt and their feelings about um, what they learned and their experience with their first birth. Um, we went over the current guidelines in that, too. I gave them a um, facts and questions handout. and. Um, 
also a question to ask a provider handout because, um, like I was saying earlier, it's not uniform between um, practice settings. So one practice um, could be totally supportive of VBAC, but another one would say, you know, no, we're not giving you a VBAC, or no, you're, you absolutely can't um, have a vaginal birth. Um, so phase two was this online decision aid tool, the pregnancy, should I try vaginal birth after a past C-section um, from HealthWise? Thank you for posting that again. And um, to see how women, um, to get my results, I used five tools, which were also from um, the Ottawa Institute's website. So the first tool was called the Choice Predisposition or Leaning Scale. And this um, I administered, I'll go over more in depth later what the results were, but this one, just a brief overview, um, told me what the woman was feeling like she wanted, so where she was leaning, like did she want a VBAC, was she more leaning on having another repeat, C or you know, having another C-section. Um, so that tool was administered um, after each phase um, just to see, you know, did the did, did phase one help more, did phase two help more, you know, did the combination of both um, help more. So then the preparation for decision-making tool was also administered. And it um, told me what the woman felt like. Did she feel, um, how prepared did she feel for making a decision? And then the decision tool was what decision did she make? And then the enacted decision tool was what happened? Did she end up with her VBAC? Did she end up with a C-section? Um, and this was administered um, two to six weeks postpartum. And then the decision regret scale. And this told me, um, you know, how did she feel about um, what happened? And all the women returned the data to me by, um, via email. So um, I only had seven women interested in my study, um, even though, you know, recruitment was very difficult um, to get people interested in wanting a VBAC. They were so scared because hospitals don't offer it, physicians don't offer it. Um, so I could only gather up seven people, um, and my average age was 30.71 um, years, so they ranged from 24 to 35. I had six Caucasian women and one Hispanic woman. Um, six were married, one was not, and the average um, gestational age was about 28 weeks. So um, this was largely due to um, the fact that I wanted to graduate, so I didn't have that much time to recruit. Um, and so many of my women were, you know, 26 to 30 weeks, and it would have been ideal if I could have um, recruited earlier in the pregnancy. So um, this was um, the results of the how effective was the shared decision-making program. Um, so for the preparation for decision-making scale, you see that orange is before phase one. So phase one was the education session. Um, yellow is after phase one. And then blue is after phase two. Phase two was the um, online decision aid tool. So as you see, before, a, um, before phase one education session, the women had a low self-perception of preparedness for decision making. So they felt like they weren't prepared to make a decision. They um, you know, just weren't prepared. And then after the education session, they felt a little more prepared, as you can see with the yellowish mustard color um, bars. And then after the combination of the um, education session and then the HealthWise tool, they felt really prepared. And then the results of my leaning tool, um, same colors, the orange is before the education session or phase one, um, the yellow color is after phase one, and then blue is after um, phase two. And so you can see that four women before um, the program wanted, they were strongly leaning on having a VBAC. Um, two were undecided. And one was definitely set on having a repeat C-section. 
And then the after the education session, six wanted a VBAC, and one still wanted that repeat C-section. And then um, after the HealthWise tool, same thing, six wanted the VBAC, and that one was still dead set on the repeat C-section. And then six decided on VBAC. One had an elective C-section. Um, that's what they decided after the program. But then um, after I talked to them postpartum, five ended up with their VBAC, and two had the C-section. So the one who chose to have a C-section had her scheduled C-section, and then one ended up having an emergency C-section. And um, I'll tell you a little bit more about their stories in a minute. And then five felt no regret, zero felt low regret, um, and then two women felt moderate regret. Um, so the one woman, these results were actually pretty surprising um, to me because I read in the literature that um, women who do this as shared decision making feel lower regret, but um, the woman who decided to have a VBAC but received an emergency C-section told me that um, she felt a lot of regret because she wishes she just didn't get her hopes up and um, went back and had the repeat C-section. Repeat RCS is repeat C-section. And um, the women who decided to have a repeat C-section had more pain and um, felt like she couldn't care for her toddler during her recovery period. So she regretted choosing that C-section and wishes that she chose the other option. So the two people with the unexpected outcomes wish they chose the other alternative, which is kind of interesting. Um, so this is a very small pilot program, um, but it was effective uh, to prepare women to make a decision about TOLAC. Um, and I also found out that online education may be more preferable for women. Um, and in regard to the two women who regretted um, their decisions, it could be that they didn't expect to have um, the outcomes that they did. The woman who scheduled a C-section, she didn't remember it being so painful. She thought that it would just be easier because she was ready for it this time, but um, she just didn't anticipate the pain to the pain she felt physically. Um, you know, not being able to care for a toddler, lift her toddler, um, run around with her toddler. And then the one who had the failed um, TOLAC, she um, felt very depressed that her hopes were shattered, is what she verbalized to me. Um, she, she felt like she didn't have a chance to um, have a proper trial of labor. Um, and her story, I'll, I can share it with you. She said it was okay. So she um, was 40 weeks. Her doctor told her she could not go past um, 41 weeks. So they scheduled her for an induction at 40 weeks and six days. Um, they did a balloon. And um, do, do you all know what a cook's balloon is for induction? I don't know. Um, anyway, it's a, it's a catheter-type device that you insert into um, the vagina, and there are two little balloons, um, and one kind of sits and dilates, it mechanically dilates is, is basically how it works. Um, one sits in the vagina and one sits in the uterus, so it mechanically dilates. Um, and so the doctor that was caring for her didn't feel comfortable um, giving her Pitocin, so Instead of letting her go into natural labor, he just decided to do this Cook's balloon to um, induce her. Didn't start Cytotec, which is good because Cytotec is not um, safe for people who have had prior C-sections. Um, but she was only four centimeters dilated and still at a minus two station. And um, the doctor really didn't want her to go to 41 weeks or beyond, so he went ahead and um, artificially ruptured her membranes. And so, of course, the, she was 
high, the baby's station was high, so she, um, the baby went into fetal distress and the heart rate plummeted and she had to go back and get her emergency C-section. Um, so that's, that's what happened with her. And um, so limitations of this study, small sample size, um, largely due to recruitment issues. I, I do strongly believe that this program would have um, succeeded. I mean, it, it showed proof that um, it was worthwhile, but I think it, I would have had more success recruiting women to participate in areas where VBAC was supported. Um, Texas is kind of like the good old boy state, and they're, they're stuck in their ways. They don't want to um, kind of be progressive at times. So um, they're just really scared to, yeah, change their culture. Um, so in places like New York and um, other places in the Northeast, uh, VBAC, um, their VBAC rates are very high, um, and C-section rates are a lot lower than um, down here. Um, I had time constraints, so women in the project were near beyond their third trimester, um, and studies have shown that the shared decision-making program for VBAC, um, or for making a decision during pregnancy, is more effective earlier in the pregnancy. So even as early as preconceptually, um, we should be talking to women about their birth options after a prior C-section. Um, and then um, there could be bias um, because women who seek midwifery practices, um, they desire they desire a TOLAC. Um, so a lot of women are just complacent and they they do what their physician tells them, and that's kind of like the normal standard of care here. Um, and also another limitation was the scoring of the Ottawa Institute's tools. So all of them were really great, but the decision regret scale did not have hard cutoff values, so I had to just make um, a decision about um, no, low, moderate, and high regret. So recommendations for research. I would recommend um, a larger sample size with a comparison group. Um, I would also evaluate if the shared decision-making program for VBAC actually reduces C-section rates and healthcare costs. Um, and also, I would like to further investigate um, the regret after a failed TOLAC, um, because that, that came up as an issue after all my data was collected. Um, recommendations for practice. Um, educate staff about the VBAC. When I was trying to recruit women, I first went and taught um, the medical assistants and um, the midwives about the current guidelines of VBAC and um, the risks and benefits. And one of the medical assistants actually said to me, well, I don't understand why you're offering VBAC. Isn't it very dangerous? And I'm like, well, no. No, this is what the research says. So um, it's the culture. So it's going to take a while just by talking to people, presenting the evidence, um, trying to encourage to stay up to date is kind of the key to get past this, um, these negative beliefs about um, TOLAC. And um, I would also follow up with women who may feel regret with their birth decision after a C-section. Um, after distressing circumstances, I did read a systematic review um, that focused on um, post-traumatic stress disorder based on birth. Um, and it said that um, cognitive behavioral therapy is helpful for women. So if they meet with a, th a therapist, then they can kind of work through these feelings and gain confidence again and reduce their anxiety and kind of just make sense of, of how to cope with, um, you know, how, you know, just cope with what happened to them. Um, and a lot of birth centers now, they try to offer a, a group um, debriefing for women who feel like they need to talk to someone, but this actually isn't effective. Um, it helps in the moment where the women feel like, you know, they can get this off their chest, but they really need an outlet for um, helping them to actually work through these um, feelings they have. All right, that's it. Does anyone have any questions for me?
you'd like to ask Amy a question. Oh, I see. He's raised your hands. Hi, Marie. Find you. Yeah, Marie, go ahead. What's your question? Is there research on the level of VBAC for midwives? Um, what do you mean by this question? Do you mean do midwives seem to perform VBAC more or? Okay. Yes, um, midwives do and that's why these women were seeking out midwives because um, most physicians just flat out won't offer the VBAC. So the, the few midwifery practice that exists in this um, North Texas area, they, you know, they are known with, for their successful VBAC, so that's why these women um, sought them out. Kat, I actually made a pamphlet um, or handout if you want. I, I don't mind sharing it with you. It's based on all the current evidence. We've got time for one or two more questions and then um, we might need to um, move on and thank Amy for presenting today. Is there any further questions before we do that? Sure, if everyone just, whoever wants the handouts, just put your email and I can um, send them to you. Sorry, and I agree with you, Tammy. Amy Hood could also put the, the slides on, on the, the, the wiki or the website, if it's okay. Oh, uh, sure, sure. I can do that. That's a good idea. Thank you. Um, well, I think everybody's had um, quite a few questions throughout, which Amy has fielded really well, while, while not sort of interrupting her presentation. So that was excellent. Well done, Amy. and. Um, it's really interesting to see that um, even though it's a small study, I think it opens up some really important questions. And for me, some of the key things were that you conducted this online, that there was an opportunity to, um, to do research with women who, um, who are much more accessible online than trying to catch them in their busy lives. And I'm really interested in, in that aspect of it. Um, interesting that you pull together those areas around decision making tools, and I'll certainly be hunting up that website in Ottawa. Thank you, Ottawa. And, um, and uh, thank you also for um, sharing the ups and downs of the research process and um, what a struggle that is within a culture that is not supportive of women um, experiencing um, a vaginal birth after caesarean section. So I wasn't left with any real questions about your research, um, but I'm sure that you'll be able to respond to any that um, others have got once once you've got all their emails and, and your slides are up for them to look at again. So thank you very much Amy and congratulations on putting that research <coughs> project together and best wishes as you um, step into your midwifery role. Thank, thank you. you.